talk about Jerome of Prague. He was also a Bohemian, better known today as a Czech reformer. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, as we study the history and the word of God here today, please give us the faith of the great men of old. And bless us, indeed we ask, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Our message is entitled, Do You Love Truth? Do You Love Truth? Go with me in your Bibles to Psalm 119, Psalm 119. And once you find Psalms 119, then I want you to go all the way to verse 100. Psalms 142. So Psalms 119, and then we're going to go to verse 142. When you get there, let me know by saying amen. 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 I heard about half of everyone. Psalms 119 and then verse 142. Do we all have it? Okay, here we go. The Bible says, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. Thy law is what? The truth, according to what we just read there, the law of God is the truth. Go with me to the New Testament, John chapter 17. We're going to the Gospel of John and we're looking at chapter 17 and then we're going to read verse 17. So chapter 17 as well as verse 17. Amen when you get that one. The Bible says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So now we have two verses. One says thy law is the truth. One says thy word is the truth. Here's the skeptic. Are they contrary to the other? No, they're complementary to the other. So not only is God's law the truth, but also his word is the truth. Go with me. A few chapters backwards, you're still in the book of John. And we're going to go to chapter 14. Notice what Christ says in John 14 and verse 6. Christ says this, you have it? John 14, 6. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So now we have three. Principles all combined. The law is truth. The word is truth. Yea, Christ himself says, I am the truth. Do you love the truth is the question. Do you love Christ? Do you love his words? And do you love the boundaries? I'm going to say of his love. Do you love the boundaries that he places? Discipline is not a negative thing. When I was younger... In the heat of the moment, go with me to Hebrews. Go with me to Hebrews. When I was younger, in the heat of the moment, I did not like the discipline that my father had given me. I did not like the discipline that my father had given me. But the Bible says that we should not despise the chastening of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12 is where we're going. The Bible says this in Hebrews 12, beginning verse number 6. Actually, beginning in verse 5. Hebrews 12, verse 5. We all have it? Okay. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, quoting Proverbs, he says, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he does what? He chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you 
as with sons, for what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, wherefore, where, sorry, whereof all are partakers, then are ye basically born out of wedlock. And you're not really sons in the full sense of the term. In other words, if this is a child that I don't care anything about, if this is a child that I don't see, I don't want to, I don't care to see the prosperity of his life, then I'm not going to bring him any chastisement. I'm not going to try to correct him. Why? Because I just don't care. But when someone cares, they give you chastisement. When I was young, my father would chasten me. And in the moment, oh, I couldn't stand it. I'd be so angered at times. But you know, Looking back on my life, if there was one thing that I think about my parents above another that I'm grateful for is their discipline in my life. They gave me boundaries. They gave me rules. They gave me structure. Because I look back and it helped me to become a better person. It helped me to love and to respect. It helped me. And this is what God wants to do in our lives. The Bible continues to say, Verse 9, furthermore, we had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For verily, for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. That's what they did. But he for our what? For our profit that we might be partakers of what? The reason why God allows His chastening to be in our life is so that we can obtain unto holiness. It's for our betterment. It's for our prosperity. Not in earthly goods, of course, but for our eternal benefit and profit. Sometimes trials come to our life for these reasons. And so some people say, well, I can love Jesus. I can come to love His Word, but I don't know if I love His law. Because that's a part of the truth. We learn that the truth comprises those three, the law, the words, and Christ himself. Do you love the chastening of the Lord? It says don't despise it. And not that you love it because going through it is easy, but you love it because he is trying to bring you unto holiness. Do you love the truth? Keep those principles in mind. We're going to end on some of those very principles. The last time I stood before you, when we looked at history, we were looking at the country of Bohemia. That country is better known today as the Czech Republic. And we looked at one of the great reformers in those times. His name was John Huss. It says that his final words, when the flames were kindled about him, he was a martyr. He began to sing, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And so continued till his voice was silenced forever. Unfortunately, another stake was to be set up in Constance, Germany, where that council was held. The blood of another witness was going to testify for the truth. And that other man, his name was Jerome. Jerome was a friend and co laborer together with John Huss. We learned about Jerome that he bid Farewell to Huss when Huss said, I'm on my way to go to that council. And he had exhorted him to courage and firmness. And notice this in the emphasis. He declared that if he, John Huss, should fall into any peril, that he would fly to his assistance. I'll be there, brother. I'll stand by your side and we will uphold the truth. Don't you worry. Unfortunately, in those days, they didn't have the communication abilities that we have now. There was no quick email. There was no calling on the phone. They didn't have the ability to communicate quickly. And by the time, keep in mind that Bohemia was a great distance away from Germany. And so by the time the news reached the ears of Jerome, there wasn't much he could do. He heard about the, the reformer's imprisonment, his friend John Huss. He immediately prepared to fulfill his promise. Without a safe conduct, he set out with only a single companion to go meet up with John at Constance. Keep in mind that 
We learned a little bit about Jerome of Prague. He was a citizen. He was closely associated with us. And when he went to, re to England, he had got copies of John Wycliffe, remember. And he was brought to the truth because of Wycliffe's writings. Hitherto, Huss had stood alone in his labors, but now Jerome, who in England had accepted the teachings of Wycliffe, he joined in the work of reform, and the two were hereafter united in their lives, and even in death they were not to be divided. Considering the qualities of this man, Jerome, he had a brilliance of genius. He was very eloquent. He had a lot of learning. He had that kind of personality that was more winsome to the people. He gained popular favor, as it says there. They were possessed in a preeminent, that's a strong word, degree by Jerome. In other words, he was a better public figure as far as his ability to reach out to the people was than John Huss ever was. This guy could preach. He had charisma. He had the ability to hold the attention of the people. But in those qualities which constitute real strength of character, Huss was the greater. His calm judgment served as a restraint upon the what? Impulsive spirit of Jerome. So Jerome had charisma, but he was very impulsive. And even though he had that impulse, he believed in the experience and in the character of John Huss. And with true humility, it says he perceived his worth, John Huss, and he yielded to his counsels. Under their united labors, the reform was more rapidly extended. I want to take a sidestep here from Great Controversy and show you something that I came across in the book Child Guidance, page 161. Remember, it says the qualities of strength of character was found more so in John Huss. Strength of character consists of two things. Power of will and power of what? Give me a synonymous term for self-control. Temperance. Many youth mistake strong, uncontrolled passion for strength of character. How many of you have ever heard of Alexander the Great? He was only in his 30s. And he could conquer the whole world. But you know how he died? In temperance. He partied too hard. The record shows, though it hasn't been 100% confirmed, the record in most cases show that he died from alcohol poisoning, from celebrating his victories of battle. He could conquer the world, but he couldn't conquer himself. What about Samson? Was Samson strong? But though he was the strongest man physically, in reality, he was one of the most weakest men because he couldn't conquer his own indulgence, his own lustful passions, his own abilities. He could not control them. And as a result, he died an early death. Strength of character consists of two things, the power of will, make firm decisions for God, and self-control. But the truth is, skipping down, but the truth is that he who is mastered by his passions is a weak man. The real greatness and nobility of the man is measured by his powers to subdue his feelings, not by the power of his feelings to subdue him. The strongest man is he who, while sensitive to abuse, will yet restrain passion and do what? Forgive his enemies forgive his enemies this is evidence you know the bible says that we need to bridle the tongue because if we don't have reins over it what begins to happen is that we cannot come to the mastery but if we will be the master in all things we have to have temperance and that's one of the fruits of the of the spirit and how do you grow fruit you got to cultivate the garden. you got to spend time in His Word. He says, abide in me, and I in thee, and the same will bring forth what? If you were to read Psalm 1, 
It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Right? It says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And do you know what the result will be? It says, And he shall be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water that will bring forth his fruit. This is how we obtain those fruits of the Spirit and temperance, self-control, that we might have strength of character. Going back now to our history, this building still stands today, obviously a little bit renovated, but this was where they held the Council of Constance in Germany. And Jerome made his way after hearing that his friend John Huss had been imprisoned. And he says, oh, I need to fulfill my promise and make my way there. However, on arriving there, he was convinced that he had only exposed himself to peril without the possibility of doing anything for the deliverance of us. He didn't come in time. So he fled from the city, but unfortunately he was arrested on the homeward journey. And he was brought back loaded with fetters and under the custody of a band of soldiers. At his first appearance before the council, his attempts to reply to the accusations brought against him were met with shouts, to the flames with him, to the flames. And he was thrown into a dungeon. He was chained in a position which caused him great suffering. And he only fed on bread and water. Unfortunately, they left him in there for a long time. Notice what this says. After some months, the cruelties of his imprisonment brought upon Jerome an illness that threatened his life and his enemies. Fearing, sorry, that threatened his life and his enemies, fearing that he might escape them, treated him with less severity. He said, this guy's going to die in the dungeon here. So they eased off of their severity and notice it says he remained in prison how long? An entire year. By the way, in those days they didn't have air conditioning, heat, light. If you were in a dungeon, you were in the dungeon. Does it get cold? Sure. You think they came over there and gave him a little heater and put it next to you and said, there you go, buddy. They didn't give him any of those things. If he was there in a whole year, that means he passed all the seasons. It was too hot in the summer. It was too cold in the winter. He was suffering to the point where he almost died. Now the death of Hus, generally speaking in Prague and in Bohemia, and the whole Czech Republic at the time, the death of Hus had not resulted as the papists had hoped. The violation of his safe conduct, if you remember when we studied, he had been promised by the emperor Sigismund a safe conduct. Not only the emperor Sigismund, but he also was promised that by the reigning pope at the time. But it was a violation when they had arrested John Huss, and that roused a storm of indignation in the country. And as the safer course, the council determined, since we didn't have a good rapport with the people, this time, instead of doing the same thing to Jerome, instead of burning Jerome, they said, let's try to force him, if possible, to do what? Retract. To retract. To retract means basically to, I'm going to say, renounce your positions of the truth. In other words, take back all the declarations, the public ministry, the pamphlets that you sent out. Take back all that you have said against the Catholic Church. Retract those truths. So this is what they tried to get him to do because already they were losing the favor of the people. I'm reading through these. We have quite a bit to read here, but I'm going as quickly as I can so that you can get the picture of Jerome. So they took him out of prison. They brought him before the council and offered him the alternative to recant or to die at the stake. Now, death at the beginning of his imprisonment would have been a mercy in comparison with the terrible sufferings which he had undergone. But now weakened with illness, by illness, by the rigors of his prison house, and the torture of anxiety and suspense, 
Separated from his friends, disheartened by the death of Hus, Jerome's fortitude gave way and he consented to submit to the council. He pledged himself to adhere to the Catholic faith. And he accepted the action of the council in condemning the doctrines of Wycliffe and Huss, accepting, however, those holy truths which they had taught. Can you imagine? But you can kind of sympathize a little. He was tortured. He only ate bread and water. Imagine that's all you had was a roll of bread on a daily basis to eat for an entire year. That's all they gave you. He was cold. He was suffering. Remember, it had said that they had put him in such a position. I don't know the position. Maybe his hands behind his back. Maybe he was suspended somehow. I don't know how they put him. But it said that it caused great suffering to him. So all of these elements, human nature just gave, just gave way. And he sought to alleviate himself from all that darkness. And he says, okay, I will renounce my faith and I will accept the Catholic faith. By this expedient, Jerome endeavored to silence the voice of conscience and escape his doom. But in solitude of his dungeon he saw more clearly what he had done. Because once he had said that to the soldiers, they went back and took report, and they set a date that he had to come and publicly say it before the whole council. So he was in the dungeon, and while he was waiting for that date, for him to say what he had promised to say, he had time to think. And he saw more clearly what he had done. Notice the orange. He thought of the courage and fidelity of Hus. And in contrast, he pondered upon his own denial of the truth. He thought of the divine master whom he had pledged himself to serve. Do you still have your Bibles open? The last verse that you saw was in Hebrews 12, right? You're still in Hebrews 12? Notice what it says in verse number 2. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the what? He endured the cross, Hebrews 12, verse 2, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, the reason why we are to look unto Jesus is verse 3. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. When you feel ready to give up, when you feel ready to throw in the towel, when you feel ready to say, Lord, I can't take this anymore. This Christian walk is too difficult. The path of obedience to God is too strenuous. I would rather take the broad, easy way because the narrow, straight way is too difficult. When you at moments feel like this, and you will feel like this, the greatest amongst God's prophets have felt like that. How many of you ever heard of Elijah? Didn't he run from Jezebel and go and flee into the wilderness? But the Lord in his mercy says, what, thou, what doest thou here, Elijah? There were times where Paul, there were times where Peter, there was times where Moses, a lot of men one of the biggest tools, I'm not going to even say the word tool, I'm going to say weapons, that is formed against us that the devil uses is discouragement to continue in the path of truth towards the Lord. But beloved, when you feel weary and faint in your minds, I want you to do as the scripture says here. Look unto Jesus. He endured for you. He kept pressing forward for you. He did not give up, and He did it for you. It says here in the green emphasis, before His retraction, He had found comfort amid all His sufferings. Even though He had a lot of sufferings, there was some sort of comfort and peace that He had with them in the assurance of God's favor. But now remorse and doubt had tortured his soul. Why? 
because he had consented to retract and renounce his beliefs. And he was in that dungeon. You know, when for the sake of truth you are brought into trial and hardship, God will strengthen and fortify you to endure. But if you don't have Christ, trials are magnified so great that they will crush you out. You have to have Christ. And beloved, I'm only telling you this because you know what's ahead of us? It's not a bed of roses, I can assure you that. Society is not getting any better. Society is getting worse. The laws of the land are getting stricter. The penalties are going to become more inflicted. The prices is not... Don't look forward to a time when we were in the 90s or whatever and prices and the economy was just beautiful. No. No, it's going to get harder. The gap between the rich and the poor is going to get more significant. And it's going to be more harder to make a living. Do you remember when the Egyptians had the Israelites under slavery and deliverance because Moses was being used by God had come and Pharaoh began to inquire and says, how come the people are not making their quota of bricks that they had to make? You know what Pharaoh did? Did he say, oh, I'm going to make it a little easy? He says, no, ye are idle and I'm going to take away the straw. And therefore, right before deliverance, it became harder to do the daily tasks that were assigned so that they could get bread for their families. Right before deliverance, the government made it harder for the people to have a daily living. And that's what's happening in society today, right before the deliverance. We're living in the last days. I don't know the exact time or hour, but based on Bible prophecy, based on everything that we see, we are seeing the signs all around us that something stupendous is on the horizon. And as a result of it, we need Christ in order to help us to approach this time of trouble such as never has been seen since there was a nation. He knew that still other retractions must be made before he could be at peace with Rome. And the path upon which he was entering could end only in complete apostasy. And in this short time frame, as he was thinking, what have I done? The Spirit of God buoyed up his spirit because he wanted to do what was right. And he made a decision. His resolution was taken. To escape a brief period of suffering, he would not deny his Lord. He had said it initially, but after thinking, after looking upon Jesus and considering the great suffering that his Lord had endured, he says, no, I will not deny my Lord. Go with me to Matthew chapter 10. I need a volunteer to read aloud for me. Matthew chapter 10. Maybe I'm going to sign some. Brother Brendan, if you don't mind, brother, I'm going to have you read. Matthew 10, verse 32 and verse 33. And then I'm going to have my brother Shelton read Matthew 16 and verse 24. So we're going to chapter 10 of Matthew and we're going to chapter 16 of Matthew. Brendan is going to read aloud for us Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Okay, pause there. Thank you, brother. Do you see here that if we are willing to confess Christ, that he will confess us. But if we deny him, then he will deny us. Mm -hmm. Beloved, there's no greater fearful pronunciation in the Bible than to hear the words, depart from me. I never knew you. If he's not confessing our name, that means he considers you to be a stranger instead of a child, a friend, a fellow believer. Christ cannot represent you unless you are willing to confess him. Do not be ashamed of the gospel. 
Sometimes we're in a restaurant, right? And we're like, let's say a prayer. No, don't ostentatiously stand up and make, you know, make a prayer so everybody can see. But don't be ashamed just to say a prayer. You believe in what you believe in. If you're a Christian, then stand for it. And don't think that you're in the minority. You are in the majority. This world is amongst the unfallen universe of God. Thousands upon thousands of angels. 10,000 times 10,000. Only this dark planet here, which is this small in comparison to the grand universe, is the only dark spot in God's entire universe. When you decide to stand for God, even though everyone around you may seem like you're in the minority, no, you are in the majority when you join and stand for God. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. If you confess the Lord, then the time is going to come when your name pops up in that judgment, He will confess you. Say, no, He has accepted me, and I will have Him to be saved. And the Father will acknowledge the judgment of Christ and say, okay, he is sealed for eternity. She is sealed for eternity. Notice what Matthew 16 and verse 24 says. My brother's going to read that one. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Let him deny himself. Remember, Christ says that we should look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. When we take up our cross, that's an expression to say that we have to be willing to endure all that our calling leads us to. As God places things in your life, be willing to endure and the only way to endure is if you have a mindset of not my will, but thine be done. Not what Jose wants, but what Christ wants. Deny self. Pick up your cross. Some of us don't even know how to deny self. It begins in your kitchen. It begins in your home. It begins in your decision making. It begins in your responsibilities. The little things are going to be what tests the character. If we can't make the decision on a simple choice between whether I'm going to eat something harmful or something healthy, then how are we going to make a profitable decision when it comes to life or death? The comparison are miles from one another. And we have to learn to deny self, looking unto Jesus. And so in that dungeon cell, he had remembered his Lord. And he had remembered, I'm only here. I got arrested because of the faithfulness of my friend. And he was faithful unto death. If he was alive, would I have represented my friend right? So he looked at both the example of John Huss and of his own Lord, and it created a stir in his heart. And he says, no, I'm going to do what is right. So they brought him before the council. He renounced his former recantation. And as a dying man, solemnly required an opportunity to make his defense. Fearing the effect of his words, the prelates insisted that he should merely affirm or deny the truth of the charges brought against him. Just say yay or nay. But Jerome protested against such cruelty and injustice. You have held me shut up 340 days in a frightful prison, he said. In the midst of filth, noisomeness, stench, and the utmost want of everything. And you then bring me out before you and lending an ear to my mortal enemies, you refuse to hear me? If you be really wise men and the lights of the world, take care not to sin against justice. As for me, I'm only a feeble mortal. My life is but of little importance. And when I exhort you not to deliver an unjust sentence, I speak less for myself than for you. 
Don't deny me my final words, in other words. All that I've been through, the least you can do is let me say something. So he was brought before the council there. And in front of everybody, before he spoke, he kneeled down and he prayed to the Lord. His request was finally granted in the presence of his judges. Jerome kneeled down and prayed that the divine spirit might control his thoughts and words and that he might speak nothing contrary to the truth or unworthy of his master. To him that day, remember Sabbath school, was fulfilled the promise to the first disciples. Ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake. But when they shall deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Amen. Amen. We talked a little bit about that. God had given him words. And guess what his sermon was all about? His final sermon. You can compare it to Stephen being stoned. You remember Stephen being stoned? Stephen, if you read it in Acts chapter 6, went down a whole list of the history of God's people up until that point. And in a similar fashion, but not exactly, but in a similar way, Jerome went through the Bible and explained how they had always condemned the just. The words of Jerome excited astonishment and admiration, even in his enemies. Notice this now. For a whole year, he had been immersed in a dungeon, unable to read and even to see. He was in darkness, in great physical suffering and mental anxiety, a whole year. Yet his arguments were presented with as much clearness and power as if he had had undisturbed opportunity for study. Can you imagine? He preached so clearly, so precisely. He named the text, the scripture, the verse so precisely as if he had unmolested study for the entire year. When in reality, he had no study the entire year. It was true evidence. I can only imagine. I wasn't there and it doesn't really say, but I imagine his face was glowing. Because God gave him such a tongue before his enemies. To say the words of God. Notice in the blue. He pointed his hearers to the long line of holy men who had been condemned by unjust judges. In almost every generation have been those who, while seeking to elevate the people of their time, have been reproached and cast out. But who in latter times have been shown to be deserving of honor. Christ himself was condemned as a malefactor at an unrighteous tribunal. tribunal. So in before, before he closed his message, in self-reproach for his own denial of the truth, Jerome continued, Of all the sins that I have committed since my youth, none weighs so heavily upon my mind and cause me such poignant remorse as that which I committed in this fatal place. When I approved of the iniquitous sentence rendered against Wycliffe and the holy martyr John Huss, my master. Yes, I confess it from my heart and declare with horror that I disgracefully quailed when, through a dread of death, I condemned their doctrines. I therefore supplicate Almighty God to deign my, to pardon my sins, to pardon me my sins, and this one in particular, the most heinous of all. Pointing to his judges, he said firmly, you condemned Wycliffe and Huss, not for having shaken the doctrine of the church, but simply because they branded with reprobation the scandals of the clergy. They're pumped, their pride and all the vices of the prelates and priests, the things that they have affirmed and which are irrefutable, I also think and declare like them. And therefore he confessed Christ in the hearing of everybody and publicly said, I 
except the Lord, and I will not recant as I formerly did. He publicly, he publicly confessed his previous recantation. You think the Lord gave him grace? He did, he did. But his words were interrupted. The prelates, trembling with rage, cried out, What need have we of further proof? Away with the most obstinate of heretics. They did the same thing to Stephen, you know. Stephen, they cut his sermon short, and they gnashed on him. Jesus, they, they did the same thing. Ere long, the sentence of condemnation was passed upon him. He was led out to the same spot which Huss had yielded up his life. Check this out. He went singing on his way. His countenance was lighted up with joy and peace. His gaze was fixed upon Christ, and to him, death, it had lost its terrors. When the executioner, check this out, about to kindle the pile, had stepped behind him, he was going to light the flame from behind him, the martyr exclaimed, come forward boldly and apply the fire before my face. Had I been afraid, I should not be here. In other words, don't light that fire back there. Come around here and light it right before my face. I'm not afraid. His last words uttered as the flames rose about him were a prayer. Lord, almighty father, he cried. Have pity on me and pardon me my sins, for thou knowest that I have always loved thy truth. The question is, do you love truth? Do you love truth? Do you love truth? Go with me to Second Thessalonians. As we start winding down our final, final text here. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we have been given a warning, especially for the last days. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. The Bible says here in verse number 9. This is referring to Antichrist power. Verse number 9. This is referring to Antichrist. It says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not what? that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a what? And the reason why is because they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. See, in these last days, as we're seeing the movements that are going to bring forth the final battles of earth, People are making their final decisions. They're either going to accept the Antichrist and the movements that he will promote. Or they will accept the truth. And it says that if we don't come into a love of the truth, that we are going to believe the strong delusions of the last days. Notice John chapter 14 going back there. John chapter 14, I read in your hearing, John 14 and verse 23, the Bible says, Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode in him. If we love the truth, remember we learned that Christ was the truth. He says, if a man love me, what will he do? He will keep my words. He will keep my words. I want to encourage you. In your studies, 
as you do your daily devotions, everyone does their devotions differently. And I'm going to suggest a few things to you if you need help in learning personal devotion time. When you wake up in the morning, it's natural that you use the restroom, etc., etc. But make it a habit that as soon as you roll out of bed, just say a prayer to the Lord. Lord, thank you for another day. Thank you for waking me and keeping me through the night. Lord, this day, I want to serve you. I want to be instructed. I don't want to just pray for my family, although they are on my heart. I want to pray that you would help me to grow in my character that reflects you. Say a prayer similar to that in, in your reading. Maybe you spend a little bit of time. Maybe you're reading through the Bible. Some of you have devotional books. Some of you have um, a larger reading that you're doing. But as you read, you will come across a principle of some sort. Something will stand out to you. You know, you take your pencil, you take your highlighter. Some of you highlight books. Some of you write. You write your little notes. Whatever it is, you will come across a principle that will stand out to you. Maybe it has something to do with always telling the truth. And then begin to examine yourself and say, you know what? I was talking the other day and I lied to that person. Or maybe it has something to do with your body is the temple of God. And you can think back in the last few days and you say, you know what? I probably was a little bit indulgent here. Yeah, I was. And what's important is when you come across the conviction that your life is not in harmony with that principle, your prayer then becomes, Lord, forgive me of such and such of shortcoming. And as I read this here, I want this in my life. Please help me to live out this principle. Put your Holy Spirit within me. Help me to reflect you in these things. And if I come across a trial today that's going to test me on this point, I need you to be near me so that I can glorify you. And you watch the Lord begin working in your life. If you're sincere, you will find yourself and the Spirit of God will remind you. Remember your morning devotion? You remember that you had said, Lord, help me. Here's your help. Are you going to make the decision? And in that moment of temptation, you'll say, no, I will not deny my Lord. But here's the thing. The devil wants you to skip your devotion. The devil wants to make you too busy. The devil is going to ring the, the, the phone. The devil is going to make you check your emails. The devil is going to make you get on TikTok and Facebook and get distracted. And by, the, by the time you know it, the, the day has come. And now you're busy and you haven't spent the time. And then when the temptations come, you don't have the tools necessary. And you fall once again. And you live a life of always, man, I keep messing up, keep messing up. And then you're tempted to throw in the towel. You say, I can't even be a Christian. I'm going to encourage you. Take the time. Let me ask you this. Those of you who are married. Do you always get along with your spouse? <laughs> a lot of times there are differences among us, right? We're two different people. That's natural. But here's the thing. If you want a blessed marriage, you have to take time to iron out and come to mutual agreements. If you put off the work to say, no, I don't want to hear you. No, I don't want to. And then we just don't listen. We sweep it under the rug. You know, sometimes time heals the anger. And that's fine. But time doesn't always heal the principle, the root cause. In order for the root cause to be dealt with, you have to communicate, come to God's word, pray together, and find victories. You can be upset with each other and then walk away. And then a few, oh, I'm sorry, you know, that's fine, I'm sorry. Or some people don't do that, you know, they have different ways of how they just make it better and kind of sweep it under the rug. And the anger is palliated, but at the same time, the very issue that keeps coming up in the marriage, it hasn't been dealt with. Why? Because we're unwilling to examine ourselves, see where my fault is, see where our struggles are, and ask God to help us to develop a plan to have victory over this attack from the enemy in our marriage. 
And when you see that God begins to work because he says, if two come together and they agree on earth, then it shall be heard of my Father in heaven. That's Matthew chapter 18, by the way. So this is what you have to begin to do. You have to examine yourself. And then here's the thing. Daily your devotions are going to help you see yourself. Because your shortcomings don't just affect you. They affect everyone around you. My question to you is, do you love truth? Self-examination is important. Jerome had to examine himself in the prison cell. Some of us are in the prison cell of our circumstances. Maybe we're not being tortured as Jerome was. But based on years of the same old situation, here I am, I'm stuck, and I'm never going to get out. Don't give up. Look to Christ. Love the truth. Here it says, the reason why so few accept salvation is that men do not love the truth. They're not willing to search the scriptures. That they may be wise in the things of God. We read that many in Christ believed in Him, but did not confess Him, lest they should be turned out of the synagogues. For they love the praise of men rather than the praise of God. A lot of people know that they're attending churches and they don't hear the truth in that church. They attend it for convenience sake. They attend it because it's close to my house. They attend it because, well, they're friends and I've you know, I got to get a little bit of Jesus in my life and I just go. But they haven't been admonished to say you need to find salvation by searching diligently the scriptures. Not only that, in a lot of those churches, they are led to believe that if they depart from that church, they're going to be damned. As if salvation is through the membership of the church. A lot of churches have that disposition. Unfortunately, even those that bear the name that we have. SDAs. They have this feeling that, oh, I can't depart. No, beloved. This is the reason why today men are not brought to repentance. Why they do not accept the infinite sacrifice that heaven has made and grasp the only provision by which the sinner can obtain salvation. We may present the attractions of the gospel, the eternal weight of glory, the life that measures with the life of God, with its eternity of blessing, but their spiritual eyesight is blinded by the pride and vanities of the world, their minds held by its maxims and traditions, and they cannot see the glory that is in store for the overcomer. They cannot accept by faith God's overtures for mercy in the gift of His Son because they're not searching the Scriptures for themselves. Their standard of truth is whatever I found out on YouTube. Their standard of truth is whatever is coming from the news station. Beloved, the love of truth as it is in Jesus means the love of all that is comprised in the truth Christ taught. The Son of God came to our world humbling himself to take human nature, that he might give us an example of what human nature may be if we follow the teachings of his word. He was tempted in all points, as we are tempted, yet he was not overcome by sin. He is our pattern in all things. We are to express to the world his perfection of character in how many of all our experiences? All of our experience. The Bible says, in all thy ways, acknowledge him and he will direct thy path. My admonition to you all, brethren, do you love the truth? If you love the truth, Christ says, my sheep, hear my voice. And what do they do? They follow it. Follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And even if you have to follow in his footsteps to a martyr's death. Follow him and you will obtain salvation. Amen.
Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we have heard your appeals through the principles of this message. Lord, do we love truth? May that be our question daily. Help us to follow the words, to keep them. You promise that if we love you and keep your words, that you and the Father will make our abode. We thank you, O Lord, for your long suffering in our life. Help us to repent from all known grievances to thy spirit, sins that so easily beset us, pronenesses to wander. And Lord, take our hearts and seal it for thy courts above and bless us that we might bring you glory and that we might set a right example to those who are also seeking the path to shine as lights for you. Thank you, O Lord, for your mercy in our lives. And thank you for the truth. In Jesus' name, amen.